All right, welcome everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about web components through the theme of <laughs> a Western. So we're going to talk about the good, the bad, the web components. Uh, but before we can get started, we kind of have to set the stage here in the context of web development. A component is just a piece of reusable UI. Uh, components can control their structure, their appearance, their behavior. And here's just a sample component from a uh, framework and library you may be used to, um, React. It has the component definition there up top. We're just jumping right into to some script here. Um, and it's a button component. It returns just a button HTML element. And you see the usage down below, uh, just a my button uh, tag. So pretty straightforward. And this has kind of been popularized by a bunch of different component frameworks. Um, there's really no shortage of, shortage of JavaScript frameworks right now. And many of them really lean heavily into components. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just a ton of them out there and it's it's been going for a long time. But today I wanna to talk to you about web components. So a web component is a subset of the component hierarchy. Um, it's really just a piece of reusable UI that's enabled by web standards. So features that are built into the web platform provided for free by web browsers with the potential to initialize faster and run with less library code and less overhead. So my name is Zach. Uh, you can find my website, zachleet.com. And I created the 11D static site generator. Um, shout out to Quinn Dombrowski, uh, who I think is using it in the Stanford Literary Lab website, um, which is kind of cool to see. And I'm also a staff uh, engineer at Netlify. Now, I don't think uh, a lot of developers will admit this, but we're very social creatures that are prone to trends, just like any other profession. Um, and so in this section of the presentation, I'm gonna give you what we call social proof, um, but it's just really raw peer pressure um, from me, one of your peers. So Microsoft has really leaned heavily into web components. Um, they have a fast design design system and they've used it to build the MSN website. Um, so it's a really great example of using web components in the wild and they've published this website uh, to show you how to use it yourself. And Rob Eisenberg, who worked on, at Microsoft on fast design, um, has said that over 1,500 teams at Microsoft and or projects um, have adopted these fast web components in the last three years. So you can go out and read that article. It's a great article. Now, VMware has another really good one. It's called Clarity, Clarity Design System. And I really bring this one up because Web components are really unique in that they offer a lot of value for design systems um, in that web components are very portable. Um, they don't require any library framework usually. Um, so you can have component code that can be used in a bunch of different contexts um, in a bunch of different frameworks. So a lot of folks that are building design systems really appreciate web components for their portability. Another couple of quick examples. Salesforce has a nice component web component library called Lightning. Um, and then GitHub is leaning heavily into web components as well. And you, as well. And you can read some of their articles online. And one of the biggest, I think, most successful examples of web components in the wild is Adobe's Spectrum web components. They've actually brought a full-scale implementation of Photoshop to the web using web components that are based on the lit library from Google. Um, so you can read about their design system and how they've implemented Photoshop on the web. So are web components a thing? Yes, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see all these logos that are flashing across your screen right now, but web components are a very successful thing used by very many big companies. Um, and you can see them in the wild in a lot of different places. Google Chrome has published these metrics about web component usage. Um, and in April, 2023, they measured that 18, almost 
of page loads in Google Chrome had a web component on the page, um, which I think is a very good example of how successful web components and the web component specifications have been. And so back to these component frameworks, a lot of these individual frameworks are actually leaning into web components as well. Now, Lit and Stencil are actually based on first party web components. They publish web components and are web components. But many of these other frameworks as well uh, have support for publishing individual components built with their framework to web components. So web components are seen as more of a compilation target. So let's get into what web components are and how we can build one from scratch so we can get a good idea of what benefits the web component specifications buy us. So just the quintessential framework component example is the counter component. We love to see a button that has a number on it. We click the button and it increments. So just consider this my counter HTML element, and by itself, it doesn't do anything. We haven't assigned any behavior to it. We haven't assigned any actual markup to this component, but we can use the custom elements API to assign behavior um, to the component itself. And that's what this code does. So we use the custom element registry to define a my counter component, and then we pass in a class. And that class can then define what that component can do on our page. And importantly, this doesn't require any library JavaScript. This is all built into the platform and something you can copy and paste into an HTML page uh, and use today. Now, there are a few restrictions over what you can name your custom elements. They do require a dash in the name so they don't conflict with existing um, component names that exist as part of this HTML specification. So if you try to define a, a custom element that doesn't have a dash in the name, it'll throw an error at you. So just keep that in mind. Now we want some actual markup as part of this component so we can use that markup to interact with on the page. So let's put a button inside of our my counter, and then we can use that to increment and assign behavior from the custom element registry. And that's what this giant block of code does. Um, we've taken our previous example, which used the custom element registry. We assigned our my counter custom element, and then the connected callback lets us assign certain behaviors to our component. So we select the button using query selector button, and we add an event listener that says, when you click the button, look at the text that's inside the button, convert it to an integer and add one to it. And here's what it looks like. Pretty simple, but again, no library code, uh, no extra overhead here. Everything you see here is provided to you for free by the web platform. And the only thing we did in our JavaScript was to add event listeners. We didn't modify the HTML that was inside of our custom element. We didn't modify uh, the DOM in any way. So in, in a way, this is a exclusively server rendered component. Um, and again, no library JavaScript was used here. So one of the things I like to do when I evaluate components and how they load and how, they how we um, control the experience of how we're loading our assets on a page is I like to look at what it looks like before the JavaScript is initialized and what it looks like after the JavaScript is initialized. And this can give us an idea of our layout shift as well. So when our components load and our JavaScript loads, and if we modify the DOM in some way, it can uh, introduce content shifts on the page. And this is actually part of Google Chrome's core web vitals. Um, uh, excuse me, measurements that, that they use to influence search rankings. So we want to reduce the amount of content or content shift that happens when our components load. And we can have full control over the CSS that is used to apply to these components as well. With the colon defined pseudo class, um, we can control how a component looks after it's been defined, after that JavaScript runs. And we can control how it's how it appears before that JavaScript has loaded. 
And this is what Fast Design does for their components now. I wouldn't recommend this because I don't think it offers the best um, progressive enhancement strategy, but this is just one idea of a thing that you can do in your components. It hides the component altogether until the custom element has initialized. Now, again, this would make the before JavaScript experience nothing. Um, so that has its own drawbacks. If the JavaScript errors or doesn't load successfully, or maybe a web extension conflicts with it in the wild, um, you wouldn't see anything on the page, which I don't think is the greatest fallback experience, but that's what fast design does. I think maybe a better experience is to style the button as if it looks like it's just normal text. Now there are some additional accessibility implications here. We don't necessarily want the button to be a button before we load it uh, because it will have the accessibility semantics of a button. But this is just one example of something that you can do to make the to make the before JavaScript and after JavaScript experiences um, line up visually with what you would expect. And because we're just modifying the border and the background color here, we don't actually have any content layout shift, which is nice. So again, this is server rendered. There's no library JavaScript, and we get a great progressive enhancement experience without layout shift. Now the drawback here is when you have a bunch of instances of this component on your page, all of the markup inside of there is repeated. And this kind of violates our don't repeat yourself uh, principle. Um, so if we wanna author these components from scratch, we don't wanna be copying and pasting all of our internal HTML throughout all of these different instances of the component. And this is one of the drawbacks of using just standard HTML um, inside of a custom element is that you do need to repeat that markup. This is what I feel like would be a better authoring experience. We don't have the repeated HTML inside of it, but the custom things that we want for our individual instances of the component um, are the only things that we need to author. And to do that, we'll graduate to level two, which is using the shadow DOM. Um, so here's what an example of uh, shadow DOM HTML might look like. We have our individual three, uh, our three individual my counter instances, and then we have a template which has the reusable um, markup inside of it that we're going to inject into our component. And I've kind of, I have this giant code block, but I've kind of grayed out the repeated stuff that we used in our first example. And so the three lines that we see highlighted here are just the new uh, JavaScript that's used here. So we select our template using get element by ID, and we attach a shadow DOM to our component, and then we append our template content using uh, content.clone node from the template. And that actually takes our template HTML, uh, inserts it into the component instance, um, and then customizes it for our individual components. So you can kind of see that we're using this slot element, uh, which is part of HTML and part of the web component specification to take the default content from our, the default child content from our individual instances. And that gets injected as child content inside of the slot. And this is all part of the shadow DOM specification that's provided to you for free. So this is kind of what it looks like when you look at the live representation of how it renders on the page in the web browser. So in your browser's dev tools, you'll see the individual um, child content is, it's treated as slotted content. So it's nested right inside of the slot element. Now the downside here is that we're using JavaScript to modify the, uh, the representation of the component on the page. So it's a little bit more risky when it comes to content layout shift. So if you look, our before JavaScript and after JavaScript uh, experiences, they don't line up in the same way that the first example did. Um, this is kind of called a flash of unstyled content, um, but it also you also get pe penalized for layout shift in Core Web Vitals, which is not ideal. And this kind of comes with client rendered 
components. So Shadow DOM by itself is client rendered. We use JavaScript to inject the Shadow DOM content into the individual component instances. But again, we get the same benefits that we saw in the first example. There's no library JavaScript. We have full encapsulation from the Shadow DOM. We don't have to repeat ourselves in our, all of our different component instances. And we get a, a, a little bit different progressive enhancement strategy. Um, and it's maybe not as flexible, um, but we do have fallback content if the JavaScript doesn't load. But again, it's subject to layout shift and the flash of unstyled content. So now we're going to graduate to level three, which is declarative Shadow DOM. So it's putting your Shadow DOM inside of the HTML and without a JavaScript dependency. So here's what that looks like. And this is something that is pretty new. It shipped in Safari 16 recently. Um, it's still sort of pending in Firefox, but it's available in, all, in most web browsers today. Um, and here's what the, the markup looks like for that. You nest a template inside of your component instance, and you say, I want the shadow root mode of open, which means that you it, the content inside of here is JavaScript accessible if you want to select it in, using DOM query selector APIs or things like that. Um, you can do that. And then it looks very similar to the template that we used before in our previous example. But that component, that template needs to be nested inside of every instance of the component on the page. So our before JavaScript and after JavaScript experiences are great because we aren't using any JavaScript to inject our Shadow DOM content. The browser does that for us. It looks for these templates inside of our component instances and then assigns those to Shadow DOM. But unfortunately, right now, Firefox does not support this. So you, this code block is not very important, but it is the polyfill that you can use to add JavaScript, or excuse me, add declarative Shadow DOM support in JavaScript. And I, the only reason I included this is I want to uh, communicate that it's a very tiny polyfill. Um, there isn't much code that you need to run to get Firefox support. But importantly, using a polyfill in this way does introduce a JavaScript dependency. So it's a little bit more risky in that way. But Firefox support for declarative Shadow DOM is coming. So this is something we won't need to worry about uh, long term. So the benefits of this approach, this level three approach, um, is that it's streaming friendly. It's server rendered. Um, with the exception of, of Firefox, uh, it works without client JavaScript. There's no library JavaScript again. Um, there's no overhead there. We get full Shadow DOM encapsulation, um, so things won't leak out from the Shadow DOM. And we get a better progressive enhancement experience over the JavaScript-based Shadow DOM approach. But the main drawback here is that Again, those templates need to be repeated in every instance of the component on your page, which is a little bit prohibitive, right? Because if we, in, in this code example, we have three different counter instances and this code is required to be <laughs> copied in every single instance. So while it is server rendered, there's a lot of repeated markup in your page to sort of bypass that JavaScript dependency. So there is kind of a big trade-off here. And one of the benefits of using Shadow DOM, both declarative and uh, scripted, is that you can put style blocks inside of there and they don't leak out. So if I assign, in this example, I'm using declarative Shadow DOM, I put a style block in there and I'm styling every single element inside of this component to have uh, a blue font color. Um, and this doesn't leak out into the page. It's restricted just to my counter and, and children inside of my counter. So that's kind of a great benefit, right? Um, we have full encapsulation of styles and our components, again, don't need to necessarily worry about uh, cross-contamination with styles from the outer page. Now, some styles are inherited, um, but in most cases, you don't need to worry about um, styles from inside the component leaking out into the outer page. 
now now sometimes you'll get global styles that uh, are inherited into the into the shadow DOM component, but um, in most cases this is not a, a, a big deal. So when you're using scoped CSS and you're using declarative or scripted shadow DOM, you have these pseudo classes that you have access to um, that allow you to style the component um, based on where, or like the context of how it exists in the page. So you can use colon host, and that gives you access to the parent of the component. Um, you can control certain selectors on the host component as well. Um, and then host context allows you to select parent selectors uh, as well. So a component that exists inside of another child as a child of another uh, selector, which I think is pretty powerful. And all of that can live inside of your component styles. But again, the more CSS you put into your component definition, the more prohibitive it is uh, to repeat throughout uh, your page, especially if you're authoring these things manually. Now, I don't think that the specification writers intended for um, components to be authored manually in this way, um, and we'll kind of get to a way to solve that later. So we have like these this sort of big trade-off between not repeating yourself or wanting to not repeat yourself and server-side rendering, and we almost need to choose between the two. Uh, it's this awkward standoff that exists. Um, and kind of JavaScript is the big elephant in the room here. Um, do we want to have to use JavaScript so that we don't have to repeat ourselves? Or do we want to repeat our markup everywhere? Um, and there's not a great platform story for this, but I'll show you how to solve it. <laughs> um, and level four, server-side rendering, yay. So in our previous example, we had three MyCounter instances, and they all had this declarative shadow DOM content uh, that was repeated throughout. Now, what I would like to see from the platform is all of those combined into a uh, template definition. Now, this code does not work anywhere. It's not a specification. It does not exist, but it'd be nice to see. And I think folks are working on solving this problem. And if you're interested in that, I included a link to the to the discussion, the ongoing discussion about that um, in the footnotes there. But I think one of the big complaints that framework authors have had about web components is that server-side rendering is not really directly solved by the platform yet. Um, it is an ongoing discussion and something that doesn't really exist. And in that regard, I think, a lot of JavaScript framework authors have sort of been very combative about web components um, in a way that almost felt like they were guarding their own turf. Um, the framework does, or web components specifications don't do everything that JavaScript frameworks do, so they aren't useful. That's the argument being made. But I would say that web components and the specifications of web components can be tools used by JavaScript frameworks. Um, and so if we can get along in that way, we can use these lower level uh, utility specifications from web components to make JavaScript component frameworks better. And you can kind of see that. So um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the existing component frameworks in the wild um, have supported web components as a compilation target. Um, now, there are some existing web component frameworks that are first party, so Stencil and Lit, um, but really you're seeing a new crop of server-side rendering first uh, web component libraries come into play. Um, and that is the bottom right corner of this graph. And just full disclosure, I built one of these. So uh, the left one is Enhance, Enhance.dev, and the right one is WebC, and I'm, I'm, I work on WebC. And you can kind of see if you want more information about the interoperability of component uh, libraries, component frameworks with web components. There's a great test suite at customelementseverywhere.com that you can check out if you want more detailed information about the interoperability there. But I will spoil it for you. The only currently maintained 
uh, JavaScript framework or JavaScript library that exists on the page that does not pass the advanced tests is React. So again, just coming back to the existing libraries that solve server-side rendering in a nice way for us, um, Lit and both Lit and Stencil do this. Um, now they take a different approach from Enhance and WebC in that server-side rendering is more of a secondary thing. Um, they really focused on the client-side rendering experience first, and then server-side rendering is a feature that can be supported um, later if you'd like to do that. But I think a better approach is to start with server-side rendering first. So server-side rendering is the mentality of the markup should be available from the beginning, um, and client-side rendering should be a secondary concern. Um, and again, Enhance is doing this. Um, Enhance.dev, you can check out their framework. And I work on WebC, which also does this. And so I'll just give you a quick example of something that WebC can do. Um, so if you think about our previous example where we use declarative shadow DOM, WebC is just a way to repeat that template component uh, markup for you. So on the left, we have our usage. So inside of a WebC file, just three counter instances. And on the right, we have our component definition. And what WebC does is it generates that output component markup for you. So it combines those two things for you. So you don't have to author the individual instances of this component markup. And we uh, generate this page for you, which is kind of nice. Just uh, another simpler example that doesn't use Shadow DOM. Um, you can also do um, use slots as just a first party thing without Shadow DOM at all. And so slots in WebC are treated as uh, markup that's server rendered. So we use the component definition that now just has a small style sheet associated with that and then a very simple button and slot elements. Um, and we generate markup that looks like this. So it's closer to the level one um, examples that we went through earlier that were just uh, component HTML nested inside uh, our component instances without using Shadow DOM at all. Which I think is kind of powerful because then the generated markup doesn't have any CSS repeated throughout each component instance. And you get some uh, style encapsulation as well from using this because you get uniquely generated classes for each component type. So with these examples, you get stream, streaming friendly server rendered markup, no library JavaScript. Um, we're using sort of WebC, but only in a server generated way. Um, so there's no client JavaScript loaded for these examples. We get full encapsulation. We don't repeat ourselves when we're, when we're authoring these components. And we get progressive enhancement in both cases. So if you're interested in WebC, you can try out this WebC starter project. There's some examples about how to get going with it and play around with WebC and see if, uh, yeah, you can create components um, using WebC in a way that is uh, offers a really nice authoring experience, but still gives you a lot of the benefits of the platform as well. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, yeah, let me know.